Hey, I'm Tom. And I'm John. And we're the co-founders of Hanson Frank Illustration Agency. In this series, we'll be sitting down and talking to our illustrators, finding out more about them, their artistic process, and the creative industry we work in. Welcome to our podcast. Hello and welcome to the Hanson Frank podcast. Hello. Uh, yeah, we're um, sat here this morning in Tom's place in southwest London and waiting for Emily Robertson to come and ring the doorbell. Yes, exciting. Um, I've, I've noticed the uh, disadvantage of recording a podcast in your house is that you have to clean it because all the guests are coming. <laughs> so I've spent a few hours cleaning, hoovering and dusting my house. Well, it looks very tidy Thank and you. neat. Thank um, you. We have custard tarts and the sun is shining. So... Yeah, really looking forward to this chat with Emily. Yeah, it's been nice. It's another, um, just another lovely opportunity where we can finally meet people face to face again. And uh, we've kind of got a list of topics. Um, I'm sure, as always, we'll go off in a few kind of random directions. But just looking forward to talking to Emily about her, her career to date, how she's ended up doing what she's doing, um, her process uh, and, and some of the projects she's worked on over the past few years. Yeah. All right, enjoy the podcast, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Handsome Frank podcast. Uh, we're sat here in my sunny kitchen um, with Emily Robertson. Hi. How are you? I'm good. It's very um, sunny. It's lovely. John's brought some um, some pastel donatas, haven't you? I uh, love the custard tarts. I actually texted John last night um, saying, please bring some food, because I had eaten the biscuits that I had brought last night. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I got really hungry, and I was like, they were kind of talking to me. So I went and ate the chocolate biscuits that I had brought specifically for this podcast. Oh, well, at least we've got these lovely Portuguese tarts. Yeah, I think we've got an upgrade. Mm. Anyway. We, we're, we're, we're sat here surrounded by your work as well, you've brought, which we will talk about later, but... Um, so nice to see real paper. <laughs> <laughs> you can come to my um, studio. It's full of lots of paper, lots and lots of paper. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's really important to for you to see the drawings up close because uh, you get a, an extra layer of texture and stuff that you lose. I think. When and do you, you have you kept everything? Yeah. From, so how how how, yeah. how how big is your uh, archive of work? It's very big. Um, my husband is very annoyed at me. <laughs> <laughs> He's, we've got perspex boxes full of everything, I think. The archive. The archive. Although I did have um, my, not my, the last studio I was in, the, the Bussy building, we had a fire there, mm. and which was um, cathartic in some ways, I guess, because I, I can't get rid of anything. And this sort of forced me to because... Of well, there's nothing like a fire to make, <laughs> to make you start over, I guess. Yeah. So did you lose a lot of work in the fire? Um, I lost quite a bit of sort of when... At the beginning, when I was doing a lot of editorials. And I was very good at asking for um, the magazine after it was printed. Um, so I'd collected lots of those. So, I, yeah, those got doused in water oh it's a bit sad. What, what about I mean are you somebody that's very good at having everything backed up on hard drive have you got everything digitally or yeah although my hard drive was in the studio Ow. at the time and when I found it it was in a drawer that was just filled with water oh no <laughs> but luckily I dried it out and it turned itself on and it's all still there oh really so I'm just hoping it never corrupts itself one day yeah, like well, over time. back up, back up the backup. Yeah, this is, yeah, more of the story. So when when was the fire? I remember talking to you about this a couple of years oh, back. Um, I think I just moved. So it's five years ago. Yeah. Two thousand sixteen. And were there a lot of there were a lot of artists in that building? It was just our studio. Oh no! <laughs> so it was the Bussy Building in Peckham. Yes. Which is still there today. Yes. Is yeah. it still being used by artists? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they've just, um, well, not just, but they were 
moving towards sort of making it more swish, I guess. Yeah. So mega book studios. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. a, it's a bit more expensive than. And it, than I think it's a bit less fire going on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. Um, but from there, did you then move to working from home? Yeah, so I went back home, which I don't mind too much, actually. Um, I like being able to take a break and go and do other chores or whatever. And, yeah. and where is... You're, you're still in London, aren't you? Yeah, where is home? South Norwood. Okay. So it's deepest, darkest. It's, it's still London. It has a London postcode. Yeah. it's not it's not, Croydon. It's not Croydon. <laughs> Don't mention that word. <laughs> Sorry to anyone who lives in Croydon. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Reminds me of home. <laughs> Where is home? Well, I was born in Stockport, um, and I think Croydon's pretty much a carbon copy of Stockport. Oh, I've never been to Stockport, so... Oh, it's not. very sort of north uh, town, working class. Yeah. There's a, ri- there's a nice big... There's the biggest brick... Bridge, no viaduct. Nice claim to fame. That's good. Yeah. So this, but, I guess, this leads us nicely into uh, your kind of career path, like early doors. So you were living in Stockport until what? What age? So I was. Um, my parents split when I was about eight, nine, and then we moved to Lim, which is in Cheshire. Okay. Lim's like a tiny village in the middle of nowhere and you have to learn to drive when you're 60 <laughs> to get out <laughs> to escape yeah <laughs> there's like two buses at either end of the village that go every other half hour so if you miss one you have to go to the other oh, end no. of the village so and you didn't like village life i think i probably love it now <laughs> <laughs> yeah right, right right lifestyle at the wrong time yeah yeah not so much growing up there but maybe I want to, uh, you know, go back it. now. So, so is this sort of secondary school time? Yeah. And yeah. was art a big thing for you at this point? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, um, I used to spend a lot of time in the art studios at high school. Just They would let me sit in there at lunch and just draw and doodle and spend my time experimenting with stuff. Which is really nice of them. Yeah. Um, and then I sort of, I was interested, I, like I was good at school, so it wasn't like art was just my main thing. And that was, I enjoyed going to school and I liked, like learning, mm. like lots. But were you, were you aware at that point that art could be a job? Because I know, I think for a lot of people growing up maybe in the in the 90s it was like art was always just a hobby and you weren't aware that it could be yeah no I think um the first thing I wanted to ever be was a solicitor <laughs> <laughs> exciting <laughs> <Bit different. laughs> and then um I think forensic science was sort of an interest for a while I thought that was pretty cool but no no art was never a career choice and I still don't really think it is <laughs> it's a weird, yeah I mean <laughs> I, I've literally just spent this week touring secondary schools. Yeah. Um, my daughter's 10 years old, so she's going to secondary school next year. And going to see all these art departments, um, looking at GCSE and A-level students' work, like it's, it's really, really good work, amazing sketchbooks. But I was kind of standing there wondering, do these people, you know, are they being told that this is a totally viable kind of career option? Because I think when I was at school, I guess similar time, um, it wasn't really conveyed to us as much. No, I think you, I mean, you're taught like to look at stuff, I guess. And, and there's, there's an education towards starting to understand what art history is and how you make stuff. But there's no, this is also a career. This is also what you could do. Yeah. No, there was none of that. And and when, when, so when was that realization that actually this is more than a hobby. This is something that I want to pursue as a as a as a job. And and how did you make that sort of connection? I think when I because I I left my high school to go to a sixth form to do my um, AAU levels and AS levels because they just changed it for my year. As my year's always been experimental for education. Okay, <laughs> guinea pigs. Yeah. 
Um, and I was doing art, history, media studies and English language. And I think just from doing those topics more in depth, I got a flavour of what I was more interested in and what was like grabbing me more. Um, but then I still wasn't really drawing. I didn't, I, I didn't think I could draw. <laughs> so um, it was more sort of photography and collage and um, painting in sort of an abstract way, but never, so I didn't think I would be an illustrator. So, so if we saw your work then and, and there's no real connection? No, I don't think so. Wow, that's Maybe. interesting. <laughs> Maybe, for, but I don't think so. For our viewers, you can't see your work. How would you describe it now? <laughs> I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> I draw pictures <laughs> with watercolour. So, all right, let's, let's talk through your process. Your process, I can see in front of us, you initially do pencil sketches. Yes, yeah, so, um, which also took me a really long time to get used to the idea of, like, sketching something. Because to me, it's like, if you're, when you're actually making the image, I'm thinking about, like, the line weight of the implement I'm using and the pressure. Yeah. And, and then colour and tone. And so sketching for me always seems such like a, a really weird thing to do. Yeah. But I mean, looking at your sketches compared to your then ink line work, mm -hmm. they're very, very kind of similarly matched. Yeah. Um, nerdy question. What's your go-to uh, pencil? Is it a, a 2B or? <laughs> no, it's really embarrassing. I like a HB. Oh, okay. Oh, classic. I know. So I, I another I thing know. is we, I, I, I found my old um, tin of pencils going from, you know, is it 9H to 9B, and was trying to explain to my uh, daughter in which situations you would use which one. Like, it's like, what, 24 pencils or something. Uh, and I was, I was kind of couldn't quite remember them all. So, I'd, you know, is a HB is the one to go to, right? I mean, it's like the one in the middle. It's like the, yeah. the one everyone uses. Yeah. And I think, I don't... It's, <laughs> it's quite embarrassing. I don't like a messy medium. <laughs> okay. Then things that smudge, yeah. like with the burl drawings that you can see. Um, there's no smudging there. There's no smudging. You left or right-handed? I'm right-handed. Okay. Um, but that was like a pain in the bum. <laughs> I had to sort of angle myself and make sure that I wasn't leaning on stuff. Cause yeah. I did, yeah. But they're very, I mean, yeah, they're very clean and precise. And I think what's really interesting about you sometimes you'll deliver a draft and it almost looks you know a client will look at it and kind of think well she, she's done it yeah mm. um whereas actually there's then another layer to your process which involves a light box yes yeah, so then i take the sketch um and then i put a watercolor sheet on top and use the light box to um i guess it's tracing yeah but yeah tracing my sketch let's call motion. it replicate <laughs> Tracing is a dirty word. Technical. Yeah, yeah. There was, there was a real stigma around tracing as a kid, wasn't oh, yeah. there? If you did a good drawing and then it was revealed, it was a tracing. It was, oh. it was, a, it was a bit. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I think so. When I was um, the first job I did for Marks and Spencers, um, I found out that other illustrators use light boxes, and I was like, "Oh, you, what? Yeah. I can't do that." And then, and that sort of. Yeah. And then I realised, oh, there's time. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've noticed it, this is a kind of common theme um, between artists that have a hand-rendered style, like, like yourself, some of the other people we work with, David Sparshot, Sarah Maycock, that there was, all of you have had a bit of an epiphany at some point in your mm. career, early, earlier on, the better really, that it doesn't have to be just kind of one take, nail it, finished drawing you know there, there can be an element of um editing whether that's digital or whether that's yeah using a light box i think you just have to realize that at some point especially if everything is by hand because time you have to factor time in mm. and clients you know yeah. feed, feedback is inevitable so yeah i think but i think everybody at some point comes to that realization that um it's not inauthentic to have yeah flexibility yeah. in your style you know it's, it's a necessity of being it's okay to have a light box guys yeah that's the message yeah. 
<laughs> so then uh, adding colour, how are you, are you doing that then on a separate piece of paper? Yeah, so it depends like what the client has asked for. If it's something that I don't do too much of these anymore, but um, black line drawings and then with the colour added. Yeah. So I will do that all on separate layers so that I can then scan it in and play with it on Photoshop just so that there's that leeway. Yeah to edit and amend and especially if a, a client does come back and say we hate this mm. you, it's not it's so, not back to square one it's not so soul crushing <laughs> so um i, I want to just go back a little bit because i remember i think the first time i ever became aware of your work and certainly when you first got in touch with us the one thing i recognized was marks and spencers <laughs> uh and it was huge i mean your work was all over yeah, it was pretty weird. My grandma had a field day. <laughs> Every Marks and Spencer she was going into, pulling over a shop assistant. That's my granddaughter. So, so we're, we're talking nice. really large kind of panels that were all over the store. Basically, every store in the country had your artwork. Yeah, so I think it was so it's around 2006, 2007. And I'd just graduated. And... Um, Marks and Spencers were um, opening up home stores, which were dedicated just to their soft furnishings and home edits, I guess. Um, and so they wanted, and they had, um, I worked with Graphic Thought Facility, um, who were in charge of that brief. And it was large scale, um, I guess, scenes of objects. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I think, I, and I've met a few illustrators that have had this, but there's something quite exciting, but but also a bit stra strange and a bit kind of bewildering about landing a huge job as soon as you graduate. Um, obviously, it's fantastic, mm. but it it maybe sets your expectation levels for what your career is going to be like very high. <laughs> yeah, I was very um, disappointed for the next year or so. <laughs> and yeah, so, so how, how how did you handle that? Did were you thinking at the time, wow, this is it's going to be like this every week or were you aware of the fact that these big jobs um, come around rarely? I felt very lucky, especially because I knew that I was up against some really well-known and brilliant illustrators for the, the, the commission. Um, but I think, and I think they went with me because I was a student graduate and obviously mm. cheaper than everybody else. <laughs> I'm sure they picked you purely, purely on the <laughs> no. way. But it, I mean, it was really, really beautiful work. So I think, I, I can't remember when we first met. It must I have been... it was 2012. 12, I was going to yeah. say 12, yeah. Um, and I just, yeah, I mean, I, rem I remember looking at uh, your work and just thinking, oh, wow, you're, you're that person. I've looked at these drawings um, a thousand times. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So so what what was that? So you had you had kind of six years post-university of um, going it alone, you, did, you didn't have an agent before us? No. So what what was that like and what did that teach you and what was good about that and bad about that? Um, so I moved to London in 2007 and I did approach some agencies with my graduate portfolio <laughs> and realised pretty quickly that that just wasn't... People just didn't understand the work and I, and I, and I sort of understood that it needed to be in a context that agents and people who were going to commission me would understand and see, oh, that's what she can do and I can see it exactly going into this, which we need. Yeah. Um, so I sort of, um, I think I just did what everyone does and um, made a list of people I wanted to approach, found out their contact details and then sent personal emails. Yes. It's drummed into you. Yeah, Never do thing. forwards. <laughs> yeah, we still get them. <laughs> Never do forwards. I think I yeah. Were you at university were you were you kind of taught that as a um as a module, you know, how to promote yourself? I think um in the last two weeks. <laughs> oh really? I I I I mean we do a, a fair amount of with the universities. I'd I'd love to do more, but yeah, I do think that there's on most illustration courses, there's a, a lack of education around how to promote yourself as an illustrator. Oh, yeah. Um, just really, really simple, fundamental things. Like when you, what we always say is when you submit your work, 
just include uh, a couple of low res JPEGs so that you can see it right there. And you, know, you don't have to click through to the website or anything like that. Mm, I think there was a lot of learning, I think, over that period of time and um, of after graduating. My course was very, I would say it lent more towards the fine art side of things than design, so it was sort of more conceptual and I don't think there was very much learning the business of illustration for mm. sure. Did you enjoy your degree? Yeah, I did. Okay. Where was it? Um, Glasgow. Okay. Nice. Yeah, Glasgow. We do speak to quite a few people that didn't enjoy university. Really? Yeah. Uh, I would put myself in that category, but I don't, yeah, there's just people who weren't, don't feel like they were learning enough or weren't being challenged enough. Um, I think it's those, as you've kind of learned, it's those really critical couple of years after graduating mm, where yeah, you really definitely. F- find your feet, um, discover what, you know, what kind of one style you're going to move forward with um, and start getting some sort of traction in terms of commissions as well. Yeah, because you're, you're by yourself then and you, although it's, I think you would have built up a sort of network of people at art yeah. school, which is really handy but you are essentially by yourself because you're working for yourself. And, and that kind of goes back to, you know, when you were uh, in that shared studio, which mm-hmm. I remember going to, and there was, you know, lots of other incredible artists surrounding you. Did you, do you feel that you needed that in your earlier parts in your career, but now that you're more established, maybe you don't. So that's why you're yeah, happier working so. from home. So I'm trying to like <laughs> psychoanalyze. I think, I think it's all about what you need at the time. Yeah. And after a while, the sort of the business of sharing a studio with people and the admin of that and yeah. the endless, endless emails is just, yeah, something I just decided I didn't want to yeah. be involved I, in anymore. I think it's a really crucial thing for people to do in the beginning part of their career or, or any part. But I think that to go, I think it's harder and harder to do these days, especially in London, because mm-hmm. there's just not those kind of cheap, affordable studios. No. Um, yeah, but to graduate and then suddenly be at home on your own with probably only Instagram and or your parents giving you feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Two of the worst yeah. places to go. I mean, you know, Sorry, like, parents. whatever you show your parents, they're going to be like, oh, that's so good. Yeah, that's really nice. And you're not going to get that kind of honest feedback. And it, that's the thing is to get that honest, honest feedback um, from your work is so critical throughout mm. the whole of your, your career. And there, I, yeah, you definitely get that on with art directors on jobs, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's there's a benefit to being around people creating, yeah, because it makes you want to create. Um, and I guess yeah, that's that's the benefit. It's just whether you can put put with chain emails. Yeah. <laughs> and what? So what's your setup like now? Can you describe? Do you have a dedicated? work room or do you move around oh yeah I've got the second bedroom baby. okay <laughs> <laughs> um so I have the second bedroom I've got a desk set up and my scanner and bookshelves and all my work and everything and paints and brushes and things and that's nice to have um but I do like to move around and I will work on the floor <laughs> there's a fly we can know it's a wasp oh. <laughs> and like yeah we, is, we've been joined by a wasp. Oh. We're all a bit scared now. It seems harmless enough. It's it's the. Off I'm you go. I call them custard tarts because I always say that. Oh, I always say pastel de nata, but is that actually how they're pronounced? I'm I don't sure. know. That's why I call them custard. He's tarts. gone now. <laughs> the wasp is gone. Anyway. Um, and when you're working, what what are you, are you are you a radio person? Are you a music person? Do you need silence? Oh no! I need like constant noise. <laughs> I will have on, um, it's, it's embarrassing to say, but Netflix, just... Oh, do you? Binging oh, okay. dramas, oh, binging. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. And you can work and watch. Yeah. Oh, I'm jealous of that. I can't do that at all. Because some things, like, once you... Uh, not when you're sketching or thinking of, like, initial ideas, because you have to sort of have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> but um, once you're down to the business of, like, you know, I know what I'm doing and how I'm going to do it and then it's just sort of it becomes sort of like I I find I can watch 
meditative. I can watch stuff that I know really well that I don't have to concentrate on. So if it's a film I've seen a hundred times, I can kind of have mm. it on if I'm doing a fairly mundane task. But yeah, I'd, lo- I'd, I'd love to watch more TV while at work. <laughs> <laughs> well done, you. <laughs> um, so I sent you an email yesterday and, and kind of asked you about things you perhaps want to talk about on the podcast mm-hmm. um, and one of the things that really jumped out at me that I thought was really interesting and I want to kind of get into a little bit is you you mentioned you've been looking into and thinking about the history of drawing mm. and what that compulsion to draw is and where that comes from and why why we do it so what can you tell us a bit more about about that I think I've always, I was always fascinated by the first things so that the first person that picked up a bit of red ochre and said, I'm going to do a drawing or I'm going to make a mark. Or the first person that, you know, sort of discovered how bread was would be made. And yeah. Like, Whoa. How did that shit, happen? Shit, I've got bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but then I think it's more interesting. I think it's interesting that, that just this idea that humans there's something inside of us that wants to communicate and wants to express that and before language I guess that was the next best thing is just um, making a mark or making a picture and I just I don't know I just find the idea fascinating I think the oldest drawing is I think they I think I 73,000 years old wow which is mind blowing. Is, is this on the wall of a cave somewhere? Or? It's like a tiny bit of flint that has cross hatched red lines on. And they think it was part of a bigger drawing, but they're not quite sure, as with most prehistoric yeah. things. Everything's just a bit of guesswork. But it, I mean, one of the things I've noticed having kids is all kids draw. Mm. All kids draw. And then some just stop. And I've, I've got a 12-year-old who was really into drawing and now he doesn't draw anymore, which I find really sad. But I, I, I guess what I've, I find interesting is that some people never stop. And it... Yeah, I think, I think at some point maybe, maybe it's at school that people get into the, the idea into their heads that if it doesn't look like the thing, then it's rubbish. Yeah, I think there's an element of when younger children draw there's just that I don't know that they're, they're not judging themselves in a way mm, yeah and definitely and, and then you get you have more of a sense of people around you the yeah. eyes in the room looking at your work yeah, judgy. yeah. <laughs> I mean when I worked as a designer I, I remember having that kind of worry as well like, you, it, like it's not finished yet don't look <laughs> yeah don't look I think um, I was drawing with one of my friend's children and and because me and his mum can draw, he got really self-conscious about it. And he was like, oh, no, I can't do this mm. because it's it's not the same as yours or I can't replicate that. And I think that's, I don't know, I think there's something you have to overcome. And I think that's what art school is, is well, you, I learn mean, to just, to overcome just that. make yeah. and just do and then figure out what, what it is you want. Where it fits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating, but there, there, I mean, there is obviously something within humans that makes them, like you say, mm. compelled to. Because I'll marks. be sitting doing nothing, or sitting doing something else, and all, and and then I just feel the need to have a pen in my hand. It's yeah, so I was going to ask, do you do you still just you know go out and get draw stuff? I don't so much go out and do, although sometimes I take myself to the museums yeah. and sit and that's a real sort of treat for me just to draw stuff in there. Um, but I don't do like location drawing anymore. Yeah. But the one thing that really strikes me with your portfolio is the huge variety in subject matter. You seem to just be able to draw absolutely everything, which I know some people do struggle with. You know, they've, they've kind of found their, their niche, as it were, and they, they're kind of comfortable drawing that, but then they don't like going out of that comfort zone but um yeah you you have a, an incredibly wide variety of subject matter well thanks <laughs> but do you think that's um kind of helped steer your career in some ways as well you know you've drawn something and then that leads to this commission and yeah I guess that, I mean 
I, going back to the Marks and Spencer stuff, it was homewares and food. And after all, for a while, I think I that's the commissions I was getting because yeah. pe- that's be- I think that's because art directors know that you can do it. They don't mm. want to really take a risk on you not being able to do something that they they see something and they want exactly that but slightly tweaked for their yeah this is one of my bugbears that actually the creative industry is not that creative when it comes to thinking about what you're going to ask someone to draw and sometimes it's i think it's because maybe the person in charge like the art director isn't really an art director (laughs) I think it, it's. It, uh, I mean, we don't. We don't want to knock all the art directors listening. You are creative. Sorry, you're doing I a great job. I still want work. <laughs> no, no. The the, the um, one of the biggest factors in that uh, is the clients not being creative people, mm-hmm. um, which you know generally they aren't, and they want to see beforehand kind of what it's going to look like. So, if an art director can take something that's pre-existing or it might not be exactly what it's gonna what they're proposing but if they can mock that up show that to the client yeah they mm. get that idea of okay yeah this is what you're proposing um that's when it generally happens and that's that's understandable um and the only way to combat that as a as an illustrator is to try and get that breadth in your portfolio yeah mm. so that you can yeah you can be put forward for i mean one of the things um and i'm not sure we're supposed to talk about um exactly which ones so we won't mention them but (laughs) but one of the really nice things that's happened over the past two years is that we've we've got lots of work from the museum sector Mm, and i'm yeah i'm really loving that yeah i can tell (laughs) (laughs) but it, it, it and it's it's really interesting because um one has led to another and i think um one of the reasons that you're getting that work aside from just the style and look and aesthetics of your work is the fact that you have the capacity to to do research which a lot of illustrators don't and also to have a load of sometimes quite random and um not not always the best reference material and to still come out of it with a an amazing illustration so can, can you talk us through a little bit some of that work you've been doing? I think with a museum job, I sort of relish the fact that there is a sort of a histo- his- history in it yeah. or, 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 or any a chance for learning, I guess, uh, for me. And that, I think that enriches the illustrations. Um, and I definitely relish doing the work, so I think there's a bit there's a bit more love in them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I, th- I think also that when, when you, so much of what we get commissioned to do these days is used digitally predominantly. And there's some, there's something really nice about when you work on a museum is that you know, there's a permanence yeah. to it. I mean, it might not be there forever, but the likelihood is it will still be on oh, display yeah. in 10, 20, yeah. maybe 30 years time. Um, and there's going to be a lot of eyes on it. So does that, does that, go through your head and does that give it more weight or does that just kind of inspire you? I mean, yeah, it makes me feel so good. I, I re- <laughs> it makes me feel so the good. The longevity. It yeah. is the longevity of something. I did um, also with Graphic Thought Facility, they were working on a, while I was there doing a Marks and Fences job, they were working on a job for the Science Museum and they were doing the, there's a bit at the back that it's all, it's, it's called something like, about me or it's me or it's about the human body and um they asked me to just draw on some globes um i so i had to do human migration on these blackboard globes and they sit in the science museum and they're still there and i love, the fact <laughs> I that, love yeah. going there it does, and being like that's, yeah, me. that's me and I, it's not moving for a really long time it is crazy some uh, advertising jobs like for example when they go and paint the work as a mural mm. and they'll spend like I don't know a team of people will spend a week painting this mural and then two weeks later it's, it's gone. gone it's gone yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy yeah um, so it's on the flip side to have something like a museum job where you know it's going to have a real um, kind of long impact for people that's that's a really nice thing yeah I think I I enjoy the permanence and the because I, I think I the, the world is so full of images now, like so many images and, and they're 
discardable. So it's just nice to have that. Um, yeah. Um, the other the other thing I was going to mention about your portfolio is um, your handwriting. <laughs> you, I remember you, you you've had a couple of um, commissions where they literally just get you to write out yeah, write stuff. Um, it's something I've done like that's one of the, when I doodle. I do from being like young. I would doodle letters and words and and just play around. Like I'd write the alphabet a lot. Okay. <laughs> and I just yeah. It's something that it just comes naturally to me, I think, and I just enjoy. To me, sometimes writing is a bit like drawing. I'm, I'm yeah. I'm mean, looking here at a few lists you've made. I'm just jealous of anyone whose notes can look, could be functional, but also look kind of beautiful. Yeah, what a skill. I I just barely use a pencil these days. Like if I write a couple of line, my hand starts hurting. It's just those mm. those hand muscles. It, it's, oh, yeah. it's like when your first day back at school after the six weeks holiday, <laughs> yeah. where you, you've forgotten to how to hold the pencil. Um, oh, well, I'm gonna get a claw hand anyway. From do you struggle with that? I mean, on a serious note, do you have? I have to do lots of stretches, and I have to take more breaks now because I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> have there, a really um, bad illustrator's posture. And then there's like YouTube videos for like doing like for for stretching for runners and stuff like that. Are there YouTube videos for hand stretching? Hand stretching. Um, that could be a niche that you could. That could little, be some, like I could start like a little. Yeah, little foam rollers for hands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just want someone to be sitting next to my desk just to rub my hand every now and again. Yeah, well, you know, you could hire someone. <laughs> <laughs> bit weird. But... Um. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about is the, well, I think the second one's just come out, but the um, Mr. Shahar books mm-hmm. that you've been doing with Alam Shahar. Yeah. Um, and these became pretty important in my house with the first book, certainly, because during lockdown, uh, lockdown one, they became our science lessons. Explain what the book is, John. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe Emily's probably better better no. place. <laughs> um, so the Mr. Shaha books, um, Alam is a science teacher and he's put together these amazing books for kids. Um, and they're full of experiments that they, you can do at home with just things that you find at home. So cereal packets, um, sellotape, pencils, bits of paper, balloons, nothing too extravagant. And um, you can, it's, it's it's to encourage parents to um, learn along with their kids, I think. That's well, yeah, I mean, it works. We, we made a brilliant catapult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's full of great um, machines and experiments that you can do that would be fun. And it's, yeah, he's really into the idea of, you know, cutting down on plastic toys. And so this new one, The Marvelous Machines especially, is little objects kids can make to then play with afterwards and I mean they are great them. books and, and I think because a lot of stuff you get in, in, in your house as a parent is, is just not that practical but like you say these really are just based around everyday items mm-hmm. you know even if you have to finish a packet of Pringles yeah. <laughs> <have Oh>. to. <laughs> um, how did uh, like was it the publishing company that connected the two of you so this is actually a really nice little connection story Miriam Rosenblum who got in contact with me a re- like, so long ago I think maybe it's almost 10 years ago and to do a little image for a front cover for, she was working for Fide Faber at the time okay and then uh, cut to two books ago she got in contact with me again and said she'd been keeping me on file all this time. Oh, that's good. That's lovely. <laughs> all this time. And she'd found a project that she thought I'd be perfect for and um, hooked me up with Alon. We had a little meeting. Um, it was, yeah, and it was great. That's really good. Yeah. And, and the spread to, to describe the book, the, 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 you're drawing diagrams and step by step. Uh, yeah, I'm, I do all the drawing um, and I explain. I do all the um, experiments step by steps and little vignettes of sort of explaining or not sort of an image allegory of like how the what what it is the experiment is trying to teach you. And and what are you being sent as reference? Photographs? No, no, no. photographs. Um, so so um, sometimes if it's a particularly different 
difficult experiment or I, or I won't understand it, then Al Alon's made videos so I can see him making the, <laughs> the things That's and cool. I can see how it's made. Or I'll get the... I'll have the draft of the book so I can read it all and I'll make it, I'll try and make along with the yourself. instructions to see if it works out and then, and then draw from that. Yeah. So uh, have, you, have you learned a lot about science? <laughs> <laughs> I've refreshed my memory of a lot of stuff and maybe even learned some, I, something I learned and I was like, what? And it was really obvious and I was very embarrassed. <laughs> no, they, they're, they're a really nice series and they've won a few awards, have they? Um, we got shortlisted for an award. I don't know, we didn't win. Oh, mm. robbed. Robbed. <laughs> but, um, and books has always been something you've, you've done over the years. Yeah, I, I love, I've, I've loved books since I was little and, and, and getting, I remember making little books out of paper about I don't know, princesses and cats probably. Um, and so the idea that these, things are sort of real and are being sold in shops is just yeah amazing but the publishing industry is a really interesting one to learn about because <laughs> yeah. it's not how you expect it to be at all in terms think, of feedback and amends or just the process of doing it yeah and I th it, no one explains to you how it works when you get that first book commission no one explains to you sort of the long, long, long periods of time. Meandering. <laughs> I mean, I think, um, I guess what we're talking about here is is the process of doing a book cover. There's just a lot of voices at the table. So mm. you'll be working with an art director, but there's also usually a writer involved. And if, if not a writer, then maybe a, you know, a writer's family or estate if, if the writer's no longer around. Um, but then there's often the marketing team um, sometimes the retailers themselves get involved and ask for changes on a cover and the whole process becomes really convoluted so um, whereas an advertising job is often done start to finish in two or three weeks you know book covers can what's your longest uh, the longest one is probably the one that got cancelled <laughs> Shall we talk about that one? Well, I mean, <laughs> but it, the process can take, I mean, literally years plus. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, oh, I did a cookbook with Fiden and it was about a year in the process of, yeah. of, you know, going backwards and forwards and even before anything sort of got sort of decided upon, the whole sketch process is very weird. Because it goes through a team yeah. and then it goes through another team and they'll have all different feedback. So you have to sort of sift through that and decide what yeah. it is that they're actually asking for. It's a very different mm. pace to work at for an illustrator. And, and actually some of the guys we were have said books aren't for us mm. and, and other people really enjoy working at that pace. Yeah, I mean, generally when we, if we get a, an inquiry through, not just for a cover, but for a full book, um, my advice is that you know if you if you want to do it you have to absolutely love what the book is about because um, it's gonna it's gonna be take a long time to it's do it's gonna take a long time and, and maybe it's not amends. that well remunerated yeah well. <laughs> it's no absolutely but it's that it's that balance between you know the really advertising jobs that obviously pay well um, mm. and are done quickly versus these kind of love projects yeah um, and it's it's great that you're getting that real mixture of these projects as well. Yeah, I think I think that's probably necessary because I don't know how well I would survive just on book projects alone. I yeah. think you need those every now and again, those big projects. The mix. That, yeah. And I mean, an another big thing that you've kind of become known for, I think, is, is your maps. Yeah. Um, so Emily works with lots of um, real estate companies and developers, usually for, for new developments. Um, and we've done maps for projects in New York, mm -hmm. um, Malibu, was there one? Malibu. China, I believe. Hong Kong. Yeah. And sadly, we never get to go and visit. Never. No one ever, ever <laughs> wants me to go anywhere. researching. <laughs> they just want me to you look at get Google. A, yeah, a screenshot of Google Maps <laughs> and a couple of uh, photos of each hotspot. 
But it, and sometimes not even like the image that you need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that, again, I think it's testament to you as a as an illustrator, and probably one of the reasons you've become a a go to person for these maps is that um, you know they don't always have the right reference. They mm. might not have a building at the right angle. They might not even have a photograph. It could be a series of CGI renders, um, and it's a real skill to kind of take that very kind of mixed reference material and then be able to draw a map from the vantage point or angle that the you know that they need yeah i think there's i'm always sort of thinking about when creating maps uh, i want it to be informative i want it most most of the time they don't aren't used as things but i want them to be sort of within that area of like oh you could you know use this very like basically <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah they're functional as well as but also uh, yeah it's then it's the the beauty of it and how good looking it is for the client yeah yeah and we did because we did a really beautiful series um for pentagram mm -hmm. uh, about a new york development yeah and i saw that when i was in new york did the, you see the, the development? Yeah. Did you see the hoarding? Yeah. How? T Tom gets to go and see. <laughs> yeah. Not, no, it's just good time. And I went to see Pentagram. Um, yeah, no, they, they, that was after the project. They, they were very, very happy. That's great. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed doing them. I really enjoy putting maps together. There's something about the process of figuring out, like, where are the roads or whatever goes and where things things go and how it will look and yeah i think i think it's a position of it yeah. it's, it's a real strength of yours and um again it's like this classic thing that we're talking about of if it's in your portfolio people will ask for it mm -hmm. but because you've got these really strong examples now in your portfolio this has become a real kind of regular yeah thing for you um yeah i would recommend to all aspiring illustrators to have a map yeah your... just maps are the way to go guys yeah maps good handwriting that's what people need <laughs> And a variety of subject matter. Um, there's something else you mentioned in your email uh, yesterday. You mm. had a uh, beef with someone online. <laughs> and both John and I were like, what? We we don't know what that, that is. I can't remember. Did that project not come through you then? I, I, no, I, I, now, yeah, I do remember. So talk us through it. Mm, oh, no. <laughs> who, who did you upset? Well, I think I wrote, um, so So not only was it like a good project but like dream client um was you know and i i think i just joined twitter maybe <laughs> and i was doing some research of, for the book and sketching ideas and thinking about things and i don't know why but i just thought maybe if like i just thought that's what people did on twitter um was just reach out to people and be like hi <laughs> and that's what i did and she did not like it oh. She didn't like it at all, and she got in touch with the editor, and the editor then got in touch with me and was like, "You, you have to apologise to everybody now." I, it, I mean, joking aside, I guess a bit of a cautionary. I mean, you've probably learnt from it. Oh yeah, uh, never uh, talk about anything or any on social media. <laughs> I, and I think it's you know, as an illustrator, um, we are increasingly working in an industry where you're asked to sign NDAs and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you do. You, I th you know, on a serious note, I do think you have to be talk careful what you talk about mm -hmm. um, in terms of projects until they're out there in the in the universe and it's been confirmed that you can. Yeah, I, I think I thought I was being clever, but also, I don't think I, I don't think I mentioned it explicitly, but I get why she didn't like appreciate mm. that. It should have been completely private. Mm. Yeah. Well, we learn from experience, eh? Yeah, there was lots of learning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and what's next for you? Like, I always ask illustrators when we get together, you know, who would you love to work with? What's the dream project? Um, what what are the kind of career goals you've you've got for the future? It's weird. I have been thinking about, I guess, the, just the longevity of my career and how long this is gonna go on for and, and what it is I would like to sort of get into a groove of doing and definitely the museum work I, I get I get so much sort of excitement and inspiration from it I'd just love to keep doing more of that really yeah and um but I have been sort of playing with the idea of um doing a book 
maybe i don't know something personal and for me i guess the more personal work than okay so something self-initiated yeah self-initiated i haven't done anything like that for such a long time and and maybe maybe now is the time to do that and yeah i think everyone in their career has that internal thought of how long is this gonna last yeah um yeah you're not because it also it just feels like a fluke yeah well i think yeah i mean it what's interesting for us is we've now been going for 11 years Mm. and we're we're getting older and our artists are getting older and it's um you know we do work in quite a young industry (laughs) so it's um it's really interesting to see how people are changing over that time and um how their careers are going and and how they see themselves moving Mm. forward and whether that changes with age or not or I think I I definitely I think it's an age thing where you sort of start to think oh well I can't just keep thinking things will keep going I have to have some sort of plan in there to to make it last I I think yeah I mean I think generally um artists work subtly evolves over time and Mm. you probably the artists themselves don't realize it as much as someone looking at it from the outside but subtle things like color um are going to help change the aesthetic of your work um yes you probably are doing it but you don't realize you're doing it oh well i actually i because we're um we're in the process of building a new website so i went through all of your work quite recently Mm. yesterday in fact and yeah, there's absolutely been an evolution over time um, between the work you were doing kind of even five years ago and where you're at now. Yeah, I think maybe it's maybe it's a lot... Oh, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to look at it because it's all made by my hand. So I'm yeah. like, well, it's all me. But that gives it a more... Uh, it's a style that's more timeless than, mm. you know, I don't know... A, vector illustrator or someone who's doing something very more stylized very more stylized um that's gonna in theory date quicker yeah i i I mean i remember when we first met at the pizza pilgrim you were looking at my portfolio and you you said to me you're not cool (laughs) no (laughs) did i say that i think but i knew but i knew what you meant like you meant that sounds I'm, like I'm something not, I, I would say. Not I'm not, <laughs> I don't have a, it's not a, like a, it's not like a hip style. It's not a flash in the pan style, no, is it? it's yeah, not it's a not. style. It's, it's, you know, there is, if I want to, yeah, I can make this last because it's, it's, there is a traditional, traditionalism to it. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a distinct memory from that meeting as well. I, I remember you really clearly saying, um, I I I, th- I think I'm really good at this, and, and I think I'm at the point now where I'm ready to have an agent, and I really liked that confidence. But also, I think that's really interesting because you did six years yeah. without an agent, and that probably has served you really well in the long run. I think sometimes artists feel they need to jump straight in with an agent and sign with somebody, but actually, you probably did a hell of a lot of learning during that six years that have served you well. Yeah, and and also you just have a I do feel a bit more removed now from the process, having you guys do all the communicating with the clients and reaching out and stuff. Um, in those six years, it was a, there was a lot of meeting people and talking to people and, and making those relationships, which have stood me well over time. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. still coming back to you. Yeah, they're still coming back to me. So it's um, I think it's really important when you leave that you have a good solid sort of understanding of how your business works and Mm. and and what it is the effort that it takes to go out there and and get that work and you know you can do it you know i think there's something about knowing deep down that you can stand on your own two feet yeah if if required i might not know my price point anymore but (laughs) (laughs) the, the other thing i would say for you thinking about it is you probably have more repeat clients the that's most. a really nice thing to hear because sometimes I feel like I have it's one-offs but maybe maybe it's just I th- when, when I think about the projects we've done over the past certainly over the past three or four years there's been a lot of people that have come back mm. because they've enjoyed obviously the results but also the process of working with you that's really nice to hear 
Cause it's just because you 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 are on you are on the other end of an email. You can't read people's body language. Yeah, and you don't know if they're being, you know, just nice to you because they're trying to save your feelings or whatever. Or, and then also there's their own demons in your head of being yeah. like, you've made a really terrible drawing. Everyone hates you. <laughs> um, Emily, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank I'm you. very sorry for saying you're not cool. You're, <laughs> I mean, it you're wasn't cool. like no. you're not cool, but it's just like... Emily, for the record, <laughs> Emily's very cool. Yeah. I'm not, guys. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, it's been great chatting to you. We're surrounded here by your drawings, so we're going to have a good look through them. And uh, then we're going to go grab some lunch. Indeed. Well, yeah, I hope, I hope it's interesting for people to hear. Yeah. And if you haven't already, uh, go to our website and check out Emily's work. Yeah. And you're on Instagram as well. I'm obviously. on Instagram. Cool. Yeah, I have a website. Great. Check me out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. <laughs> And if you'd like to know more about Handsome Frank and Artists, check out our website, handsomefrank.com. Thanks very much for listening. Handsome Frank. Handsome Frank.